Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 216, I chat with Peter Chaikin and Charles Sprinkle of JBL Professional about the new M2 Studio Monitor. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded July 24th, 2014. Episode 216, New JBL Speaker Technologies. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of AVSForum.com. This week's guest geeks are Peter Chaikin, a uh, senior manager of recording and broadcasting uh, products uh, at JBL Professional, and Charles Sprinkle, senior acoustic systems engineer. And we're going to be talking about the new JBL Professional M2 studio reference monitor and the whole idea of high-res audio and what makes this speaker so special. Charles, uh, let's start with you. How are you doing? Good. You have yourself. Uh, thank you. Very well. Thanks. And uh, Peter, how's it going? Couldn't be better. I, I pinch myself every morning when I wake up. It's been going so well. <laughs> <laughs> would, that, would that we were all so lucky. <laughs> uh, let me first start by saying that um, those who are watching live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Peter and Charles, and I will pass along as many as I can. Now, the reason I wanted you guys on the show is that last month uh, there was this event in New York City at uh, a recording studio, professional recording studio called Jungle City, uh, at which we listened to a bunch of high-resolution audio from very famous engineers, and the speakers that were used were these new JBL Professional M2 studio reference monitors. Um, uh, Peter, why don't you start by giving us kind of an overview of what makes what what is the deal with these monitors? What makes them special? Why are we talking about them today? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks Scott for having us on. This is it's great. It's a lot of fun for us to get a chance to to do a show with you. Uh, and that was a really great session that we were at in New York. It was a lot of fun to hear the level of um, material that we got to hear in that one session. Uh, the M2 is really, um, there were two objectives. Uh, one objective was to meet um, a need in the market, specifically both the music recording professionals and the people who are doing audio for video, specifically filmmakers, who need a very high resolution, full range speaker with high SPL to mix films. Uh, but secretly behind all that, we had another another motive and it was to showcase our latest technologies specifically in the transducer area the wave guide area that you'll be hearing more about um the the very latest of what the Harman pro group not just jbl can bring to the party in monitoring as a result the speaker has seven patents and two pending just in the speaker before we even talk about the electronics but the end goal was to create a very compact speaker, a two-way, that would uh, give the output needed at about 20, 25 feet to mix films. And that's 105 dB continuous and frequency response of 20 hertz to beyond 20K. And actually, the transducers let us go out to about 40 kilohertz. So in Yikes. a 15-inch two-way, yeah, it's, we've not been able to do it before, but these drivers make it possible. Uh, and that that was the goal from a um, a market application standpoint. But the great thing about it is that we were able to bring to bear new driver technology, a new waveguide, our DSP technology in the Harman Pro Group, and uh, again achieve a, a a box that's only about 14 inches deep, 48 inches tall, um, with no electronics in it. The electronics are outboard. That'll do 20 hertz to out to about 40 kilohertz and deliver. It's almost about 130 dB at a meter, which translates to 105 at 20, 25 feet. Well, you know, this brings up a question that I often pose to engineers anyway, uh, which is 
why do you have to mix that loud? And I, I know you might not necessarily have the answer to it, but uh, they typically do. And so I think you're addressing the what they say they want, which is these very high SPLs. But as a hearing protection advocate myself, I'm concerned and I've known engineers who have serious hearing loss because they mix so high. Uh, without getting too far off topic here, do you have any sense of, of why they need to mix that loud? Yeah, actually, there, there are three things that we can say about that. Um, when we talk about 105 dB SPL, the average mixing level is 85, and that's 20 dB, dB of headroom over that. And typically, that headroom gets used for low-frequency content. Uh, low-frequency doesn't have the same impact on your ears. I mean, it will over long periods of time, but it's really the high frequencies that become painful at, at high volumes. So that gives the headroom that you need for things like explosions and effects and, and low-frequency content. Um, the other thing is that if you have that kind of output capability, it means that the speaker's dynamic range capabilities are great. So even if you're chugging along at 75 or 80, you have that headroom to reproduce the transients, not just for a film, but for, for classical music, for instance. And of course, today's electronic production has a lot of dynamic range, assuming assuming, and, and Scott, you and I talked about this, assuming that the mixer hasn't squashed the dynamic range <laughs> either out of preference yes. or whatever. But um, yeah. we, so that 105 is kind of a, that's a, it's a guideline for film production, but it translates to 85 dB average with 20 dB of headroom. It turns mm. out that that headroom is very useful for classical and, and high dynamic range pop production. Well, and we certainly heard a, an amazing example of that at the Jungle City event uh, from David Chesky, who had recorded, uh, I think it was David Chesky, wasn't it? With, with the binaural technology. With the binaural recording. He yeah, had recorded, yeah. he had actually written a ballet, a children's ballet, and had recorded the orchestra with, with a binaural recording technique. That is putting little microphones inside of a dummy head pair of ears and recording the orchestra like that. And the dynamic range of that recording that we heard was phenomenal. I mean, I could only tolerate it for a few seconds before I had to put my fingers in my ears. It was so loud uh, in the loud parts, but it was also really clean, which was very impressive. I mean, normally you get that loud and you hear all kinds of distortion and horribleness, uh, which I did not hear. Uh, in this particular case. So uh, in the case of high resolution audio music, as we've been talking about, uh, having that wide dynamic range can really be good um, as long as you're cognizant of the dangers of playing things that loud. Yeah. And, and really, you know, Charles, I think can speak to this in, in technical terms in great detail, but really having two things, having the dynamic range and also the frequency extension uh, out to 40K means that at normal listening levels and at low levels, it's a lot easier for the speaker to do its job. And mm. so whether you're listening at high volumes or very low volumes, that kind of dynamic range and performance and that kind of frequency response means that even at 20K, you know, it's, it's a whole lot easier for it. Mm. And at low listening levels, it's a whole lot easier. So I think what you tend to notice with a speaker that has that kind of dynamic range is listening to quiet passages are equally impressive. Uh, you start to hear detail you're not used to hearing because the speaker is just, it's, it's not taxed at all. You know, it's, it's exactly. easy for the speaker to do it, what it's being asked to do. Yeah. I've, I've often made that same uh, uh, observation that if you generally stay within the linear operating range of, of a speaker or even electronics and not try to push it out to its outer boundaries. It's more likely to, uh, to be better, have lower distortion, sound better. Uh, Charles, uh, what's, what's your hit on this whole dynamic range issue that we've been talking about? I, well, I think it, uh, goes back to what Peter was saying is that when you have a speaker with a uh, very high dynamic range, even when you're not playing very loud, uh, you're hearing detail that you're not used to. You, you wouldn't get with a loudspeaker with less dynamic range. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you understand then why uh, mixers mix at these loud levels. I mean, 85 dB does, you know, may not sound like that much, but if you're exposed to that, well, OSHA, I think the standard is that for eight hours a day. I couldn't tolerate that. Well, I, 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 many different uh, engineers mix at vastly different levels, and I mm -hmm. don't know that I can really speak to that. Uh, one of the, the things that, uh, you know, at, at any level, having sound that is more dynamic, lower distortion is a good thing, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, take us a little bit then through some of the innovations, some of the... Uh, the patents that that have been issued and are pending. Uh, what are what are the new technologies being used in this M2 speaker? You yourself were involved in uh, in um, designing the waveguide, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Um, but you know, wave, the waveguide is really just a part of what this loudspeaker is and and what it does. Uh, the foundation of this system is really the transducers. And when you look at the transducers. Uh, as an example, the uh, the uh, compression driver that's being used on the high frequencies. Uh, the and D we have, and, and by the way, we do have we do have a, a graphic of that. Uh, it's, I think it's an explosion cutaway called HF driver, and so we'll we'll take a quick look at that. There it is. Well, you can see from this picture that this is not uh, the 1940 uh, Western Electric design. Uh, <laughs> this uh, this actually has two diaphragms two voice coils, two motors. Uh, if I'll draw your attention, if you can uh, see the voice coil, uh, you know, you could, there's one that's pointed forward um, that's a little bit to the left of that, uh, two to the left right there. There's the voice coil. Now it's attached to a diaphragm, and you may notice the diaphragm's got a big hole in it. These are what are called annular diaphragms. Um, the, the, the Western Electric design, it's the, the inverted dome, if you... If you know anything about the, if you're familiar with compression drivers, um, has a very large uh, diaphragm, and what can happen at higher frequencies, uh, you start to get breakup modes where the the diaphragm is not acting pistonically, and that will cause uh, various artifacts, distortions, etc., et uh, frequency response anomalies, and what have you. And what we have here is a pair. And, and and not only the one that you just saw there, but also to the right of the uh, phase plug, which is the pointy thing, is another diaphragm. It's on the other side. And mm -hmm. they're pointing in opposite directions. And here's two annular diaphragms. And because of the geometry of these things, they don't have the same breakup modes. Not only that, but we're using a composite material that has a much higher internal damping uh, – and much in turn, much higher internal damping than the metal domes that you know are phenolic that they've traditionally used in compression drivers. And what this does is it gives you really, really smooth frequency response all the way out to the top end of the transducer. Again, this is one of the reasons why this transducer is is capable of forty kilohertz. So you mm. have these two diaphragms uh, pointing into a common phase plug. Uh, phase plug does the the job of getting it, keeping everything in phase, and making sure everything adds up uh, to create a plane wave at the uh, front of the, the transducer. Um, you know, the other thing that's that's cool about this is that with the two voice coils, you have an enhanced uh, thermal uh, coupling between the motors and and the body of the transducer, um, so it has reduced uh, thermal compression. Uh, I could just well, I could I could spend hours just on this <laughs> and all the cool things that there is, but I, I I'll tell you this, uh, uh, just uh, from an experience standpoint, I've never heard anything like this before. Mm. I I never heard a, a high frequency transducer sound as sweet and as smooth and as low distortion as this particular transducer. It's while not losing any of the detail, not losing any of the dynamics. Or, or any of, or any of the things that we've come to rely on on, on high frequency trans, uh, these compression drivers for, it, mm -hmm. it really is revolutionary. And then when you look at the the low frequency transducer, uh, we've got a couple of things, a couple of interesting and patented technologies. We've got the dual uh, voice coil. Again, we have really two motor structures in here, two voice coils. And I think we have a picture. Voice... But I think we have a picture of that as well. Uh, might be called woofer. I don't remember exactly. Um... Let's see if we can find it here. There it is. Not as much of an exploded view, but uh, still, you can. If you zoom into that sideways diagram, you can probably see the two 
uh, uh, the two diaphragms, dual voice two, coils. Two anyway. voice coils. And, and those voice coils are actually wound in opposite direction. And one of the, the things that that does is that the inductance starts to cancel. It also linearizes the inductance. So inductance modulation is reduced. So you get an extended high frequency response, right? Out so of a woofer. Out of a woofer because what's happening is you don't have so much inductance because the inductor, keep in mind, the inductor is something we use to roll off the high frequencies in a crossover network. And hmm. a woofer with a single voice coil actually acts as part of its own crossover network because of its own inductance. Huh, so I never thought of that before. That's really cool. This voice coil cancels that inductance or it the the opposite winding of the of the voice coils lowers that inductance so there's more high frequencies coming through also because of the symmetrical nature of that motor structure it linearizes that the the inductance so that you don't have the in, inductance in, inductance modulation in other words if your inductance is changing as the voice as the woofer is moving through its excursion what's going to happen is your high frequencies are going to be modulated the high frequency information that's riding on that is going to be modulated and this minimizes that that effect so it's mm -hmm. it, that's that's really remarkable the other thing that's remarkable is that this voice coil on 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 this woofer is made with a special alloy where the resistivity of the voice coil doesn't change very much with temperature there's two different kinds of thermal compression that happens. One's a, one is long-term as the transducer heats up and it attains a higher operating temperature. The resistance of the voice coil changes in a normal in a normal voice coil and it will lower the output of that woofer the hotter it gets. And then the other thing is the dynamic um, instantaneous heating of the voice coil will will cause distortion artifacts in that in that voice coil. Um, you know, or in the transducer. And so by minimizing this resistivity change, you've lowered that distortion and you've lowered the, or you have uh, minimized the impact of the heating on the output of the, of the, uh, of the speaker. Mm -hmm. So these, these are really a couple of, of uh, remarkable transducers that we start as uh, the foundation of the system. And, and before, then, before we go on, before we go on, I, there's a couple questions I have. One is, uh, if the woofer, which is a 15 inch cone driver, it's pretty big. If that has better high frequency response, where's the crossover frequency? And this is a two way system. So there's a tweeter and there's a woofer. Where's the crossover point? 800 Hertz. Which okay. Is so that, that 15 inch driver is going up relatively high, not terribly high. Terribly high, but uh, relatively high. Um, and actually, you know, I, I, uh, I missed one point. That uh, transducer diaphragm on the woofer um, is designed such that the outer edge of that cone uh, decouples smoothly without bumps in the frequency response. So, in other words, if you had a uh, pistonic, uh, a, a transducer that was completely pistonic all, all the way through, out, through the operating range, um, at some frequency that um, the radiation from that woofer starts to turn into a flashlight. Okay. And mm -hmm. if it's acting completely pistonically, that happens very abruptly over about an octave. Okay. Mm. And with this transducer, it, it's not unusual for transducers to have, uh, have, uh, the, the first bending mode of the outside of the transducer and start to, uh, or to, um, um, to decouple from the outside edge of the transducer. But it is unusual to have a speaker that does that without causing uh, lumps and bumps in the frequency response. This is a transducer that has a very smooth directivity transition in its top end and doesn't have those frequency response bumps uh, that are often associated with that uh, first de that decoupling of the outside edge. Mm -hmm. uh, Beatmaster in the chat room is mentioning that CAF is all about dual cones as well. Um, and that made me think of concentric drivers, and that's really not what we're talking about here, uh, is it? No, no, it's not. It's a single cone uh, woofer. It, it, as far as the, the way it operates, it's very conventional, but in the actual details of how it's constructed, such as the dual voice coil, the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the voice coil alloy, the, the woofer cone diaphragm design, it's really quite remarkable. Yeah. Now, so in the case of the woofer, we're talking about a dual voice coil, which is what basically the, the, 
the voice coil is a coil of wire, and that's what the audio signal travels through. And as it does, it interacts with, I assume, a permanent magnet sitting there in the middle of the voice coil, causing the diaphragm to move in and out and, and push sound into the air, right? Correct. Well, uh, oftentimes you'll, you're, there are many different woofers that have dual voice coil. And normally what that is, in, usually what that is, is two wires that are wound together in the same direction through a standard motor structure. What you have in this speaker is actually a, a separate voice coils wound in opposite directions mm -hmm. with a magnetic path uh, that uh, brings the, the field out through one uh, voice coil and in through the other, which is how the voice coils, having been wound in the opposite direction, have the force in the same direction. Ah, ah, okay. And then what about the uh, the tweeter diaphragm, the compression driver, which I believe you said had, in fact, two diaph two annular diaphragms, right? Two, an two annular diaphragms, correct. So how are uh, those operating? Are they in phase? Oh, they must be. Well, they're firing toward each other. Um, so... The diaphragms are in phase with respect to one another, I'm sorry, are spatially out of phase, but the, the, uh, the pole, I'm sorry, the uh, phasing plug brings that back into in phase. They're fa firing toward each other. And what's, okay. what's nice about that is that actually the, the, the inertial component cancels, so you don't have any vibration uh, that's happening or mechanical vibration is minimized. Because the the transducers are firing toward each other. Mm, okay. Uh, Bill in Michigan is asking, wound in opposite direction but fed so they add? I'm missing something. Okay. So, like I mentioned before, they're wounded in the opposite direction. But if you go back to that woofer cross-section diaphragm, uh, uh, the uh, woofer cross-section diagram, um, and zoom in on that that motor structure. Uh, a little bit more if you could. Uh, yeah, it could be a little bit blurry, but uh, if you'll notice on the outside edge, outside of the voice coil, there's a structure there that is a return path for the magnetic field. And on the inside, what you can't see is a little hamburger made out of neodymium magnets and, and uh, front and back plate. And what's happening is, is that the magnets are oriented in, in a direction uh, where the field is going out through one edge, through one of the voice coils, coming back around that return path and going back into the other side. Uh, the, the, the motor force is a cross product between the, uh, of the, uh, the BL, which is uh, actually BLI, but it's a, it's a cross product between the, uh, the magnetic uh, flux and the current. Okay, it gives you right. a, a motor force. Now, and, if by the by the way, just 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 for everybody's information, B typically stands for magnetic field or magnetic flux. L stands for induction, and I stands for current. If I'm not mistaken, L, L in this is in this regard, L is normally induct inductance, but in this regard, it's the length of the wire that's in the voice coil. Oh, <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Maybe little L then, lowercase L. It, yeah, little L. In any case, what happens is, is this is a cross product. So if you reverse the sense of B while you're reversing the sense of I, right, because the current is traveling in an opposite direction, but right. so so is the B traveling in op opposite direction. Uh, and actually, uh, F equals MA. The, the, the force is basically when you reverse the sense of both B, the, the direction of the uh, magnetic flux, and mm -hmm. the... Uh, current through the voice coil, you've reversed both of those, the force goes in the same direction. Hmm. Okay. Well, this, so is, this they, is getting... So they're adding in phase. They're adding in phase. Okay. This is getting super geeky, but after all, this is home theater geeks. <laughs> okay. So now we get to the point of the uh, waveguide, I believe. Was that the next stop you were going to make? Yeah, I was going to make the, the next stop. The transducers are the, the foundation of, of this system. And basically the job of the, the system designer and the, you know, the waveguide is to, to not m mess up what the, the transducers are doing. Um, so from a system integration perspective, what you want to do, uh, and we'll, I guess we'll get into directivity a little bit later, but 
uh, what you want to do is you want to have the, uh, the matching directivity of the crossover point. You want a smooth directivity such that um, your, your on-axis frequency matches your off-axis frequency. Um, so the waveguide is intended to match the directivity of the high-frequency transducer to the directivity of the low-frequency transducer at the crossover point and then maintain that directivity through the rest of the, of the audio band. And that is a constant directivity waveguide. Okay, because normally it, 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 when the higher the frequency, the more directional the sound, and the lower the frequency, the more the less directional or more omnidirectional the sound. Is that the general rule? That's correct. And what's happening is, is that the upper range of the woofer, its radiation pattern is starting to turn into a flashlight, like I mentioned before. Um, mm -hmm. And even though this, is, this transducer is very good at that, its directivity is still pulling in. And what happens oftentimes if you don't have pattern control, as an example, if you have a, a, of a woofer with a, uh, just uh, for just the sake of conversation, uh, dome tweeter is an example. You don't put a waveguide around that dome tweeter. You have a much smaller diaphragm. You get to the, to the crossover point and the radiation pattern of the woofer and the radiation pattern of that tweeter are completely different. Hmm. And what happens is, is that you can get the frequency response right on axis you can't get a right on axis anywhere else in the room. And so it's only by controlling the directivity of that high frequency transducer that you can get a stable uh, in room response as well as the on axis response. You can get a, a frequency response on axis that matches what's happening in the rest of the room. And we have a graphic to show that too. I'm, I'm looking up for the, the name of it. It's called directivity or uh, something along those lines. Um, there it is. Uh, okay. Here's, here's an example. Here is, on the right-hand side is the M2 loudspeaker. And what you'll see, actually, pay, uh, zoom into the speaker on the left-hand side. Just This is for uh, comparison. And you have a frequency response on axis that doesn't match what's happening off axis. You'll see in the off axis at 60 degrees, you're going to have a, of a, have a suck out in around a 2 or 3K range. I guess I, as I remember this roughly, measurement, roughly, sure. Yeah. So you have a you have a marginally flat on axis response, um, and you have a anomaly in the off axis response, and you know uh, we move over to the right speaker dia uh, diagram, and here you have a loudspeaker that has a has a fairly flat on axis response, and you move off axis, and it doesn't change very much, and and what this does is it gives you, um, if you look at loudspeakers in a room, you're not just hearing what's coming directly from the loudspeaker. You're hearing that plus what's, what's bouncing off the walls and floors and ceilings and all these other things. And if the directivity response isn't right, number one, you're going to hear an anomaly in the way it sounds and it's not going to sound right. But number two, then you can't, you know, if you have good sounding loud, or I'm sorry, if you have speakers with good directivity control um, and you put them in a room, the sidewall reflections, as an example, can be integrated into your sense of space soundstage. So you can have uh, a soundstage that exceeds the width of, between the speakers. And mm -hmm. That's when, when you do this right, this is when the speakers uh, uh, figuratively go away and, you, and you're hearing th not you're not hearing the loudspeakers, you're hearing through the loudspeakers into a sense of space that you wouldn't otherwise get. And, and this is simply just not messing up the directivity response of the loudspeakers. Mm -hmm. We actually have a diagram I think I sent of, of uh, the sound field around the speaker as well, around a pair of speakers. There you go. Uh, in conventional speakers, you have a sound stage that extends, you know, from one speaker to the other and in front of the speakers. But here... We're, this is an example of a J, the JBL3 series, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, sure. You actually have the uh, soundstage extending beyond the limits or the physical locations of the speakers and also even behind them. Well, it, it is true. One of the things that I really like to do, I, I, I really enjoy giving demos, but uh, uh, I, I like to turn the loudspeakers around. And the the look of disbelief that I get when I turn one of these loudspeakers around and have good directivity control is it it's it almost as though it shouldn't sound like that, but mm. it really should. 
the, a speaker with good directivity response, um, you can be listening to a, a stereo image. It's going to give you a wide sound field. You're going to hear a sense of space. You're going to hear a very solid center. But what's really cool is being able to walk up almost to the plane of the loudspeakers and still hear a cohesive center. It's one mm. of the things that that is continuously commented on is like, wow, these are different. These these have a, a center that is just it's it's very it's very detailed. It's it's not ambiguous. It's not uh, it's not muddy. And and being able to go up almost to the plane of the loudspeakers. And and in and in doing so, these you can get you can be across the room and you, or you can be at two feet from these, and and you still get very much the same, um, they're very much the same experience. Mm -hmm. it, what's really cool, it, it, you're talking about uh, as as far as a studio monitor, is being able to be anywhere across the a mixing console and be able to have confidence in what's in your mix. Mm. But even beyond that. You know, a lot of people talk about being able to get used to a bad loudspeaker and still be able to mix through it. Well, one of the, you can do that timbrely and you can have mixes that have good tonal balance. But one of the things, if, if you don't have the spatial resolution, you're not going to be able to recapture that because you're not hearing it when you're mixing. And so this is, this is one of the things that I think, you know, we're talking about high resolution audio. It's not just time domain stuff. It's not just, you know, it, reverb tells them those, those are very, very important. It's also having spatial resolution to be able to hear through, um, to be able to hear through the loudspeaker as opposed to listening to loudspeakers. Mm -hmm. As you say, you, you want ideally the loudspeakers to sort of disappear and just have instruments and vocals and all the things that make up the music that you're or the sounds that you're creating just existing out in front of you that's correct that's correct mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know when you when you get good time domain response you can catch the the aspect of the sound stage of depth having a having a singer that's in in front of a microphone close mic as an example with instruments behind them with in a reverberant space and it's going to sound it's going to give a depth of sound stage and you get good directivity response and now you can have the width of sound stage that exceeds the width between the speakers but also you know, you were talking about dummy heads a little bit earlier. There are reverb. There, I'm sorry. Excuse me. There are um, uh, there are uh, diffraction artifacts that are captured as part of the head related transfer functions that cause these height cues to exist. And if you have a loudspeaker with good directivity response and good time domain response and good frequency response back to what I was talking about, the transition in the woofer and the HF, not having a whole lot of lumps and bumps in the frequency re, uh, domain. Once you have those two things plus frequency response, now you can start to reproduce those, uh, those, uh, uh, those artifacts that are going to give you a sense of height and, and, and literally have a soundstage where you can get, and eh, I don't want to say three dimensional soundstage because that's, that's a little cliche, but <laughs> when we can demonstrate it, unambiguously and draw it. each one of those elements as is demonstrable i i think it it needs you know that that is something that a that a good loudspeaker can do and mm. that's something that is that we paid attention to in the integration of the m2 mm -hmm. you know really uh, has all these elements it, it from what i heard i absolutely agree uh, and i would like to get a little more detail on the waveguide but before i do i want to make sure uh, that i ask this question web 3443 in the chat room uh is wondering what the material of the uh cone uh, surround ring is made of you were talking about how the the in the woofer the uh, surround which is the part that connects the the actual moving diaphragm to the frame if i'm not mistaken uh, is somehow special, and we he wondered what the material of that was. Well, the surround is what I was in. What, that's not what I was referring to. The surround is oh. an accordion. Uh, it's a damped cloth edge uh, uh, accordion surround on that on that woofer. But what I was calling out as special is the actual shape and design of the woofer cone itself. Uh -huh. um, the pulp of the uh, the pulp of that cone, the the shape and the and the uh, um, profile of that cone, the ribbing that's on that cone, all contribute to how that cone decouples from the outside edge. I see. Okay. All right. Got it. 
Um, uh, Web thirty four forty three again. How how would Charles compare these loudspeakers to the JBL forty four ten studio monitors? Well, I, I think we're talking about a different era, um, and those are certainly <laughs> uh, fine studio monitors. But uh, there's a lot of new technologies that's been bought, brought to bear here. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, and the, the, I, I love the, the classic JBL monitors. Uh, this, is, uh, this is simply the, the latest and greatest technology that we've brought to bear um, on accurate studio monitoring. Mm -hmm. F Loop is asking proponents of quote constant directivity or smoothly narrowing directivity often are only talking about the horizontal plane. Uh, what about the uh, directivity in the vertical plane as you move up and down? Is that important? It, it absolutely is important because if you don't pay attention to your vertical directivity, the sound energy has to go somewhere. Okay, so if you don't have uh, uniform directivity in both planes, that energy is going to wind up somewhere else. Okay, and then you have to then then you have to play the juggling game of balancing your on axis versus your off axis sound uh, sound power and not having them agree uh, 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 together. And what happens? What we do? You you have a two way loudspeaker, and a two way loudspeaker is going to have. A, a, a frequency range over which both transducers are operating. And what it's going to do is it's going, going to cause a narrowing of the directivity in that dimension, which in this case is the vertical plane. Okay. And so what we uh, because, do is we because, pay, because the drivers are on top of each other. I'm sorry, because they're on top of each other, because they're separated yeah. in space. So what we're right, going to do is Right, but separated vertically. Correct. In the vertical yeah. plane. So we pay attention to the directivity of the loudspeaker as it's in this region, and, and we match that directivity to what's happening in the region where that uh, high-frequency horn has directivity control. And so we're, we are as much as possible, and, and this is something we, we have the, the measurements, I don't know if you have the measurements, that, that show both not only the horizontal sound power but also the vertical sound power. And what's really cool about this, this particular speaker is that both horizontal and vertical uh, uh, sound power are controlled and constant over that range. Mm -hmm. So that brings us back to the waveguide. So tell us a little bit more about what makes this particular waveguide, which is that that uh, structure in front of the of the driver, the compression yeah. driver, uh, and that had to be very carefully designed. And you were, in fact, one of the people who were intimately involved in the design of that particular piece. There it is, the uh, the waveguide that the compression driver, the tweeter, sits at the throat of. Yes. Well, you may notice from the picture that this doesn't look like the. <laughs> this is not your. Yeah. This is not a uh, a standard biradial um, uh, waveguide or or horn. Uh, there's a couple of. There's actually three challenges that were that were met by this horn. Uh, one of which is, and, and and by the way, the biradial uh, waveguide, biradial horn has served us well for many years, uh, giving us control of both horizontal and vertical directivity. But it does have its anomalies, and one of the things that happens is it, it has, a, uh, has an anomaly in a, in a horizontal plane, as, it, as an example, where um, the on-axis versus off-axis uh, gets a little bit um, it gets a little bit hotter off axis than it does on axis, and so this is something that we've dealt with as system engineers, for, you know, with that horn, with balancing the on versus off, off axis sound. What we wanted is a horn that didn't have that particular you know that that uh, opportunity to get a, a horn, if you will, that behaved very much like a uh, like a dome tweeter that has that same directivity characteristic, and and smooth directivity in both axes. Um, so we had that. We also had the fact that we had this very high output uh, compression tr driver with a one and a half inch exit. Now, there's the the horn has a pattern control range, a lower pattern control frequency and an upper pattern control frequency. The lower pattern control frequency is set by the mouth of the horn, and that determines the the lowest frequency at which it maintains uh, uh, coverage pattern control. In other words, below this frequency, the coverage gets wider. Okay. Yeah. But also at the upper frequency, it has an upper pattern control frequency at which the coverage pattern of that waveguide starts to narrow. 
Okay. Yep. With a one and a half inch exit on a on a compression driver, you you normally have an upper pattern control frequency of about five to seven kilohertz, and we needed to get that up and out up as close to ten or beyond as we possibly could. And if you want to zoom into the throat area there, you're going to see that the uh, the knuckles of this waveguide actually protrude into where that throat section is narrowing you know i noticed that, that and and it really it really puzzled me i thought wow i've never seen a horn that where where the waveguide actually sort of covered up a bit of the driver itself right and and we do that to get that upper pattern control frequency the, to get the higher frequencies to spread out and have you know in this case we're talking about a horn with 120 degree horizontal coverage pattern and that is exceptionally wide for a horn loudspeaker I don't want to say Up it's unheard to, of, but it's very, very wide for horn loudspeaker, and especially and for high, especially for high frequencies, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. And so what's what's happening here is getting the upper pattern, getting smooth frequency response, getting the directivity constant and this and cons constant, not just as you look at the whole speaker, but in both horizontal and vertical planes, and then getting the upper pattern control frequency were all important things. The the little protrusions here um, were able to get that uh, frequency response out or that, I'm sorry, directivity of that HF uh, upper pattern control frequency to come up almost to 10 kilohertz. Very, very much, if you look at the directivity like of this, it's very, very similar to a 25 millimeter or one inch dome tweeter. And it's so one that, of the reasons that why that brings up the question, like why, why, not use a, why not use a dome tweeter of that size? If that's uh, what you're trying to emulate. Well, it all has to go back to the dynamic range. A dome tweeter ah. cannot play <laughs> at, the, at the output levels that, that, we're, what that we're talking about. So, Got it. So we have the, the, the upper pattern control frequency. We also have, uh, like a bi-radio waveguide, has a diffraction slot. Well, this has diffraction features. Those knobs that you see, those little knuckles that you see in there are diffraction features, but they're a blended diffraction feature that causes the diffraction to act over a length of time, such as the net effect. You know, in a horn where you have a diffraction slot, that diffraction slot forms a reflection, goes back down the throat, and causes frequency responses and not frequency response anomalies and other things. And and this. Uh, the diffraction here is blended over time such that the net, uh, net reflection back down the throat is very near zero. You look at the frequency response of this, of this, of, of this uh, compression driver in this waveguide, and it is exceptionally smooth. It's exceptionally smooth. The wow. other thing that, that the reason why, you know, the, for the reason that, uh, or for this shape, and we're talking about the directivity anomalies, is that the bi-radio waveguide is designed in two axes, the horizontal and vertical plane, basically. And mm -hmm. there's not any or hasn't been any attention paid to the directivity in the oblique planes between the horizontal and vertical plane. This particular horn is designed not just in horizontal and vertical, but in all the, in the oblique planes in between. And so we can create with this waveguide, this is a rectangular horn, but it's got an elliptical wave, it's got an elliptical coverage pattern. Mm. It's designed with an elliptical coverage pattern. Okay, so now, the, direc the directivity is controlled not only horizontally and vertically, but basically throughout 360 degrees in an elliptical pattern. Correct. Correct. Now, because the the aperture at the at the throat is wider in the oblique planes, you're not going to have the upper pattern control frequency you have in the horizontal and vertical. But mm. this is something that we're this is something we can use to put that energy where it matters, where it's just your first specular reflections off of your wall, your ceiling, your floor. Mm. That makes total because sense. That's, okay. okay. And, and, the, and it works. And so this this waveguide is designed to control the directivity of this HF down to where it cross over, crosses over with the woofer. And if you look at the spinoramas, you may have the, the, the uh, our frequency response measurement. You can see that quite a bit of attention was paid, in, paid to how these uh, transducers transition to one another. Uh, it, would be, it, looks, it would look like a frequency response chart if you have Oh, it. we don't have that one. Sorry, I, didn't, I oh, would, did not have okay. that one. Well, it has a it has a very smooth frequency response on axis, and then as as it moves off axis, when you look at the first reflections, we mm -hmm. have metrics for first reflections and sound powers, and, and as you look at those metrics, they're very similar in timbre to the on axis sound. 
you look at the the integration of the two trans uh, transducers at the crossover frequency, and you know it it it's a very smooth response all the way through the the frequency response of that loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. So again, um, we, we I'm sorry, go right ahead. Uh, the we uh, we have good time domain response. Uh, we have good uh, directivity response. We have good frequency response. We have extended frequency range. And we have the dynamic range of this loudspeaker. So mm -hmm. all, all five of these things are working. We paid attention to all five of these things when the loudspeaker was developed. Yeah. Now let me get Peter back in here uh, because I don't want you to feel left out. <laughs> You've got a lot to I'm say here too, it. I'm sure. No, uh, over to enjoy. Yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> um, let me ask you to to address the issue of system integration. Um, you know, we've been hearing Charles talk a lot about uh, directivity, uh, imaging, frequency response, so on. Uh, how does how does how did you approach the idea of system integration? And I know, for example, that these speakers are sold with the amplifiers. Uh, that go with them. So it's, you know, you've, you've developed an entire package and I just wanted you to, uh, to sort of address that issue. Sure. Um, Charles, been, Charles has been speaking primarily to the components of the speaker itself, the transducers, the waveguide, uh, the enclosure, the ports. The other part of the equation is obviously power amplifier, but the crossover, this crossover that Charles spoke about is done using DSP. And that lives outside the speaker. And actually, in the system that we um, specify for professional applications, it's in a crown power amplifier. So the speakers are bi-amplified. It requires one channel for the low frequency, one channel for the high frequency, roughly uh, in, in watt terms, roughly a kilowatt each. Um, <laughs> I think Charles will correct me, but I think it's about 46 volts continuous. Is that right, Charles? That's what it's power tested to. Yeah, so the, the speaker is, is kind of wanting to see that as maximum power to give you the, mm -hmm. the maximum dynamic range. The amp that we use is the Crown iTech HD, and it comes in a two-channel version and a four-channel version. And um, in that amp, there's DSP. Uh, the amp has fans, and it's really designed for very heavy-duty um, actually was configured for live sound applications where the amps are moved around quite a bit and the heat constraints of heat are such that the amp needs to remain cooled. And so it's not a very friendly um, piece of hardware for a, a home theater or a high-end home application. Or and even so, in a studio. I mean, you need you need quiet amps in a studio too, right? Or, or can you put them in a closet and and run in, in a run commercial wires studio yeah in a mm -hmm. in a in a commercial facility typically there's a um there's an amp room a place where they might put uh the digital audio workstation cpu and mm -hmm. that's well cooled and it's outside the listening space in smaller control rooms um you know project studios typically they may not have that kind of uh infrastructure um and so they um we struggle with that a little bit, to be honest. And so the solution for the home listener and the home application is a different solution, which um, actually it's offered by the Luxury Audio Group of JBL. And they pair the M2 with Mark Levinson amps and a separate DSP-based processor. And it's, it's very high quality and it's also very quiet. And uh, it's designed for home theater in installation. They mm -hmm. offer it in 5.1 five, five one, five system configurations, actually 7.1, with the M2s as the LCR or also in stereo applications. But the, the key point is the, the speaker is the same speaker, and it's looking for the same um, DSP tuning to deliver what it is we've specified. So why not um, why not use the the JBL amps in the pro application? I mean, I understand that that the Crown amps are intended for pro applications, but more for live sound. Uh, why not in the studio use use the JBL amps? I mean, JBL is certainly known for amplifiers as well. Good good question. So remember when we were talking about the output required 
um, for professional applications, and you were saying that's very loud. In the mm-hmm. pro application, if you're mixing a film and you need that 105 dB dynamic range, we're driving the system right to the point of, you know, it, it has to be able to do that for a week without blowing up. That's our power test. But uh, yes. you know, at that point, you're right there, and you need an amp that can deliver that. Mm. In the home application, we're not looking for an amp uh, and we're not looking for a system that's going to be reproducing raw sounds that have to be EQ'd and blended into a finished product. Um, in the pro application, you may be listening to a bass drum by itself over and over and over, and the speaker is being asked to go from nothing to full blast um, for hours on end as an engineer <laughs> tries to get a, a sound, same mm-hmm. as it is that we spend that much time on drum sounds, but yes. or symphonic or orchestral. The point is, in the home environment, we're listening to mixed material, broadband mixed material. And the demands in terms of output and power are such that we can get away with a convection-cooled amp, which typically doesn't have the output level of a of an amp that we're using in the pro area. So mm-hmm. the key point is the home, the amps specified for home use are convection-cooled, but don't have, don't deliver that 100 you know, that 1,200 watts to the woofer that mm. we we specify for pro applications. Many people don't use that kind of dynamic range in a pro control room. It depends on the listening distance and the type of material. But when you specify a speaker system for a certain application, you have to know that it's capable of doing the maximum that the spec is. So, mm-hmm. therefore, we've gone to the crown amps, which have that kind of power, uh, the iTech that we're using is actually at the very bottom of the range, the amp range. They uh, yeah. double in size and then they double again. <laughs> so mm. wow, we have plenty of horsepower. But the other part of this equation is the DSP is not only responsible for the um, the crossover, but it also is responsible for providing the coefficients used for room tuning. So if we want to control the DSP, based on how a speaker measures in a room, that DSP has to be either in an amplifier or a processor. And it, conveniently in the pro world, it lives in the amp. In the, um, the home theater world, it lives in an outboard processor called an SDEC, uh, which, which has not just the tuning for the speaker, but also the room tuning filters. And they can be addressed by software. So mm-hmm. different applications, different hardware, um, the the amps that they're using in the you know for the home application for this speaker are stunning the quality is 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 gorgeous and would be easily accepted in the pro world if we just didn't need more power Mm -hmm. i think your point about yeah i think your point about how the way speakers are used or sound system is used in a professional studio is very different from how it's used in the home because as you say the engineer might be playing that kick drum over and over and over and over and as you say also the speaker needs to go from not moving to moving as far as it possibly can in an instant uh and that's not what's going to happen in the home typically (laughs) so uh the the points are very well taken uh i do have a question for charles here from the chat room uh which is from f loop who asks Uh, Was any of the waveguide design done with rapid prototyping or a 3D printer, uh, or was it all simulation? I remember visiting um, Harmon some years ago, and uh, I was going around with Kevin Vakes, who is with Revel. Well, he's with the Luxury Harmony Group, uh, Luxury Audio Group. And he pointed out that Harmon has its own 3D printers, and they cast, you know, they made prototypes of baskets and spiders and other structures within speakers. Uh, so the question then is, are you doing that quite a bit with this waveguide development, or was it more inside the computer? And, of course, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm currently working on a waveguide for another speaker, uh, currently. And this is a process where we make rapid prototypes, and we do simulation through using finite element analysis um, at the same time. Oh, what we're mm. doing is we come up with our, as an example, a best guess as far as our, our target uh, directivity and target frequency response. And we create a physical model using either uh, fused deposition modeling, which is uh, basically where it takes uh, ABS and melts it into 
um, a uh, into a solid or using a stereolithography machine uh, where ours is like an inkjet printer and it and it has a, a UV cured resin that it builds up and they they both have their different properties and we use them for different things but we're going to create a prototype and we're going to measure that prototype in a real system at the same time we're doing a a simulation and finite element analysis and the goal of the simulation is to get correlation between our model and the actual physical prototype. Once we yeah. have that correlation, now we can move in the direction where we need to be with confidence that we're going to get there. We complete the modeling. We build another prototype. We verify that it achieves the target uh, performance. And that is then our part uh, once it does that or it takes additional iteration, which sometimes happens. Mm -hmm. does the we're using both. Does the material that the waveguide is made out of make a difference? Like, for example, you create a prototype out of ABS and you measure it and it behaves a certain way and then you make the real one out of whatever material it's made out of uh, and it behaves differently. Or am I wrong about that? It, it will behave differently, but in a different frequency range and for a different reason. The directivity aspects of that loudspeaker are set by the geometry of that of the waveguide ah. shape. Okay. But what can right. happen, obviously, uh, you know, at some point in time, that waveguide can become a bell, as an example. If it's not thick enough, it's not rigid enough, it doesn't have enough Oh, it'll start damping. vibrating and resonating itself. And just like loudspeaker enclosures, you've got to you've got to mitigate mechanical vibrations. And what we're for the purpose that I'm talking about, we're talking about getting the directivity correct and getting the response of the waveguide correct, which we're basically doing with a high frequency driver, not necessarily. Uh, hitting it at the frequencies at which the actual material is going to start to resonate. Uh, and if we do run into that with, like, as an example, a larger waveguide, we're going to take steps to mitigate that, whether we're filling it in with, with uh, epoxy or doing whatever, to, uh, to mitigate those resonances. Mm -hmm. As an example, uh, the uh, – I'm sorry, the M2 waveguide is, uh, is an epoxy-filled um, – it's a pretty elaborate construction. It's epoxy-filled – uh, for that very reason. Mm, okay. Uh, Peter, I wanted to get back to you. Uh, we had talked before the show about the difference, and I, I'd like Charles's input on this as well, but let's start with Peter. Uh, the difference between the home loudspeaker and the professional loudspeaker. And you, you mentioned one important difference, which is that engineers are not listening, well, they are listening to full range their mix, their entire music, but they're also listening to little individual parts, whereas people at home typically aren't. They're listening to the whole thing all at once. But I've often heard it said that the frequency response of a home speaker, of a good home speaker, is somehow different from the frequency response of a studio speaker. The studio speaker needs to be flat, uh, whereas the home speaker, you know, maybe you want it to have kind of the smiley EQ curve. Uh, is there any truth to that at all or or is that really not where we should be thinking? Well, I understand why that's become a perception. Um, and I'm here to say that now having experienced what this waveguide can do, um, I'm here to say that 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 a smiley curve you know, a loudness curve is an apology for for <laughs> poor in, imaging, and it's it's really true. I mean, the end. Look, the objective, and I think Floyd Tool has said it very well. It's a system. You record music using a speaker. You make your judgments based on that speaker. The recording is then played in the market, and people judge speakers using recordings. And there's something called the circle of confusion, which is. What does the speaker really sound like? Was the was the flaw in the recording? Was the flaw in the speaker? The point is that, and and, and one of the things that Harmon is very involved in is research on preference, listening preference. We have an elaborate facility with double blind um, capabilities to determine what people really want to hear, and it's been determined over the last 15 years that this facility has been in existence that. Time and time again, when you put four speakers up against each other in this double blind test, the one that's most neutral is always preferred. And to the extent that a speaker becomes disappointing when it's neutral has to do with other factors, um, has to do with imaging, has to do with loss of high frequency detail, the subtle cues that make you 
that, that please you when you listen. And so we tend to make that up by cranking on high frequency or low frequency or whatever. But hearing what's possible when you get the directivity right, a speaker with good directivity replaces the need for those enhancements. You don't need, for instance, a lot of people are fond of ribbons these days in the uh, production world because they have a very twinkly high frequency response, but there are limitations to what a ribbon transducer can do. And we said, look, if people want to hear that kind of detail, we should be able to give it to them without using a, a device like a ribbon, which suffers from power compression and the frequency response changes as it gets, changes temperature. We want to be able to do it in a very neutral way at any playback level across the whole bandwidth. And when you get the directivity right, you start to lose your need for that extra, you know, bump at 10K, 12K that people tend to like to put on a home speaker. The bottom line is that a speaker used in a professional application is designed to deliver a representation of what the material will sound like in the outside world. And we've determined that the best representation is neutral. We don't know what all those systems are like in the outside world, but if you hit the median and, and you know what your speaker is telling you in the room that you're working in and the speaker is telling you the same thing from all angles in the room, your mix is gonna hold up much better in the outside world on a broad range of systems. So the bottom line is whether we're talking about working at a production facility with a neutral speaker or using the same speaker in the outside world, you can't go wrong with a speaker that's neutral as long as it's delivering all of the detail and the material. And I think that's where speakers have, have kind of shortchanged us in the past, that a lot of the detail didn't make it out into the room. And when you hear that detail, you kind of stop needing enhancement. Uh, the main difference between a speaker used in the production area and in the home is dynamic range, rugged uh, duty cycle, the fact that the speaker has to play all week at full rated power without blowing up. In the <laughs> home, we just don't put it through that kind of, that kind of stress. But the response, the directivity, the dynamic range are all very, very similar requirements. And, mm -hmm. and you know, as, as witnessed by the fact that the M2 is being offered now uh, as part of the luxury audio group, for home theater and very high-end listening applications. And mm -hmm. it's meeting with very, you know, very positive response while it was designed for a professional application. Same speaker, same frequency response. So then the next question is, will the technology that we've been talking about today, uh, the waveguide, the dual uh, diaphragm compression driver, dual voice coil woofer and so on, uh, be uh, uh, migrated to speakers that actually are intended mostly for home use? Um, I don't know Maybe. the roadmap specifically of the, of the luxury audio group and the, we call it, it's part of lifestyle, which is everything other than pro. Mm. Uh, but, but the waveguide has found its way into some, um, some home product and has found its way into our new, very, very low cost pro speakers because Everything else aside, if you get the directivity of a speaker right, that's the biggest contribution we can make to trying to make a, an affordable speaker sound better and work better in a broad range of applications. So that technology in itself will find its way into a very broad range of project products across all segments of Harman. Mm -hmm. The drivers, we, we share drivers. Um, a lot of times the pro... Uh, area will develop a, a transducer and then the consumer area will take that and hot rod it for a different application. There are trade-offs. There are different requirements. You may give up output in favor of something else that's mm. more important. But we work very closely together and very well together. And actually, um, they uh, their contribution to the woofer was substantial. This product would not have been what it is without what they did in the low-frequency transducer. The high frequency transducer is straight off the shelf from um, Harman Tour Sound product. The waveguide, Charles was actually working on that for a consumer product. And when we came to him and said, hmm, we're doing something with a compression driver, will this work for that? And he says, it's crazy, but it might just work. 
it's, it's, it's worked so well that it's become it's really become the mainstay of our future roadmap. So mm-hmm. certainly in the pro area, I can speak to that because we know what, what our roadmap looks like. But sure, uh, you know the the technology is undeniable and is finding its way into broad broader applications. I wanted to make sure I mentioned uh, I, I mentioned a little earlier the three series. Uh, it's the LRM 305 and 308. Is that correct? Actually, LSR. Are LSR, the model that's it. Yeah, that, LSR stands for Linear Spatial Reference. And really what it is is an acronym that, um, or a three-letter letter acronym that, that means that the speaker should be linear in the space, not just measured on axis in a anechoic chamber. And mm-hmm. we've been scratching at this now for, we've been using that acronym for 10 years and this is that on steroids. So it's really a development protocol that allows us to develop a speaker. LSR is a development pro- protocol that allows us to develop a speaker that's going to be more accurate in the space, in a ver- variety of listening spaces. Um, three series, uh, the LSR 305 and 308 are five inch and eight inch two way speakers with amplifiers built into them that are the most affordable speakers we know how to make. And they're going out to a very broad range of customers from uh, home hobbyist recordists up to audio post-production users, uh, people who are editing films, um, and uh, they're finding their way into into homes as well. And this is a powered speaker. Uh, typically, people in the home don't prefer powered speakers because you need an outlet near each speaker, and the and the wiring is balanced line-level wiring and and of course, they have those beautiful receivers that already have amplifiers built into them. So, <laughs> by virtue of the fact that it's that it sounds so good, it is being grafted into the home now. But it's not the ideal setup for a home customer. Although a lot of them are going into desktop applications with computers, and mm-hmm. that that's a very good match, and it's very well suited for that because typically you have a line output from a computer, and you can feed the two speakers and and. Uh, it's working great for that. And people hear imaging at the computer that they haven't heard before. So yes, yeah. it's the three series, three series studio monitors. So M2 is the flagship out of which it's, it's kind of our, our space program out of which technologies <laughs> are evolving that we're now applying to other lines. And three series is the very first to receive some of those technologies. And uh, SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room is asking that very question. Does the uh, LSR 305 and 308 use the same waveguide technology as the M2, and the answer is yes. Yeah, and actually, uh, Charles can can speak to that. He developed both of them, and it's the same principles. It's not exactly the same waveguide. Every waveguide is is engineered specifically for the speaker. And by the way, it's a very complex piece of math. And at the end of the day, it not only has to work from a directivity standpoint, but you got to be able to manufacture it. <laughs> and that in itself is pretty elegant, what Charles was able to work out and mm. had us all just slapping our foreheads saying, how does this work? But <laughs> Charles, do you want to talk about the three series waveguide briefly? Sure. Sure. What, what's primarily different with these, these waveguides is that the three series has a direct radiator tweeter with a dome uh, as a diaphragm. And so mm. the wave shape when it enters the horn is different. And uh, the uh, M2 has a compression driver with a planar wave front as it enters the horn. So it changes the geometry. The math and the engine that creates the waveguides is the same. Uh, but speaking of the manufacturability, uh, I'll just draw your your attention back to the little knuckles that protruded into the center of the horn. Even with those, um, uh, I don't know if you have any familiarity with, with tooling, uh, but this particular waveguide is able to come out of a uh, out of a mold in one piece without any action in the tool. It's a, it's what we call straight pull, and so hmm. manufacturability was able to be uh, increased. And then you know, and, and that's one thing. Um, you know, the the way we did the M2 is one thing, but then being able to take that same technology and apply it to a very affordable loudspeaker. Um, and and get more value out of the loudspeaker because we're not paying for more expensive tooling that would be required if it had you know all sorts of slides and other things to manufacture a waveguide that would that would cost money with that would then be taken away from something else for a particular price price point. We were yeah. able to deliver a lot of value in that in that product because of that manufacturability. 
Well, I'm very impressed. Uh, what I heard of the, the M2 uh, in New York was was really great. And uh, Peter, I think I'm going to take you up on your offer to come out to JBL and take a listen to my high-res audio files. I know which is which, but I'm not going to tell you which is which because I want you to listen and tell me which you think is the high-res and which is not. And I have a sneaking suspicion you'll be able to tell the difference uh, when played on these speakers. Uh, and with that, I must say we're out of time. I thank you so much for being here and spending a delightful hour talking about totally geeking out, in fact, <laughs> about speaker design and so on and so forth. Um, Peter Chaikin, uh, my friend of many, many years, we, we go back more than 20 years, I think, in this business. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great. Great to be here, Scott. Thanks again so much. We really enjoyed this. Um, we're going to have to catch up offline and uh great to hook up again and and yep. see what you're doing love the show and also have the chance to show you what we're doing here thank you so much and uh, charles sprinkle uh thank you so much for your great work uh incredible design work and uh the result uh, i think speaks for itself thank you so much for being here thank you for letting me come on oh my pleasure uh you can learn much more about the m2 and the uh, lsr 30 uh, 5 and 308, the 3 Series as they call it, at jblpro.com. Now, of course, you can find me online at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott, also at avsforum. And you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here on twit.tv slash htg. And also on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is not yet finalized. I'm still working on nailing somebody down, but I'm sure it will be somebody fascinating, as it always is. So I do hope you will join me for that and perhaps be surprised. Until then, geek out. Geek out.